Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Rajshrina Budripad. I'm board certified in internal medicine and today's video is all about cancer. Just hearing the word cancer is scary and it's enough to arouse the fear of death. We all have a friend or family member who has suffered with cancer and in the United States, cancer is the second leading cause of death. Hippocrates, the Greek physician who is known as the father of medicine, referred to cancer as karkinos, which means crab. This is because on autopsies, tumors would look like a crab, spreading their legs and invading into tissues. Harvard oncologist Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee won the Pulitzer Prize for his incredible book describing the biography of cancer, where he describes it as the emperor of all maladies. What's fascinating is that cancer cells are actually derived from normal cells. For example, breast cancer comes from normal breast cells, and prostate cancer comes from normal prostate cells. In other words, cancer is not a foreign invader. Cancer causes angiogenesis, which is the growth of blood vessels. This was first discovered by Dr. Judah Folkman. Dr. William Lee gave an incredible TED talk on the power of food to inhibit angiogenesis and prevent cancer. One of the scariest features of cancers is its ability to metastasize. This picture shows a lung cancer that spread through the bloodstream and then grew as a metastasis in the liver. This ability to pop up in another organ is what makes cancer so scary and lethal. This is what breast cancer looks like under a microscope. So this is invasive ductal carcinoma and the cancer cells are the dark purple cells. As you can see, they're spreading tenaciously like tentacles into the tissue. It does kind of look like a crab. In every cell, there's a delicate balance between proto-oncogenes, which cause cancer, and tumor suppressor genes, which prevent cancer. For example, if there's mutations in the tumor suppressor genes known as BRCA1 and BRCA2, a woman will be at higher risk of developing breast cancer. Our immune system normally catches abnormal cells and cause them to undergo apoptosis, which means cell death. Cancer cells have the uncanny ability to evade apoptosis and become immortal. A genetic mutation is kind of like a typo. And if lots of typos accumulate and are missed, over time this can lead to cancer. This is known as somatic mutation theory. The crazy thing about cancers is their incredible ability to mutate constantly. Within a single tumor, there could be hundreds of different mutations. For example, there could be cell A, cell B, and cell C. And then upon metastasizing, it can turn into cell X, Y, and Z. This is why treating cancer is so challenging, because it's like targeting a genetic pandemonium. There could be hundreds of different mutations because cancer cells are master shapeshifters. Now let's talk about what causes cancer. Is it genetics or the environment? Well, it's a combination of both. Epigenetics is how our DNA gets expressed based on exposures in the environment. According to large twin studies that were done in Sweden and Denmark, Genetics account for 27% and environment actually accounts for 73%. We can see the power of the environment when people immigrate to the United States. For example, the incidence of breast cancer is two to four times higher for women living in the United States compared to Japan. But when a Japanese woman moves to Hawaii, after a few generations, the breast cancer rate becomes the same. On the contrary, the rate of stomach cancer is five times higher for a Japanese man living in Japan as opposed to a Japanese immigrant to Hawaii. When it comes to the environment, diet plays a huge role. We know that diets high in trans fat, processed meats, sugar, and refined flours are not good when it comes to cancer. Next, we have tobacco. Smoking increases the risk of cancers in the lung, mouth, esophagus, bladder, kidney, stomach, pancreas, and colon. So don't smoke. Chronic and excessive alcohol use can also increase your risk of cancers in the mouth, throat, esophagus, liver, and breast. Exposure to radiation, such as the UV light from unprotected sun exposure, can put you at higher risk of skin cancers. You also get exposed to radiation when you do a CT scan, so you only want to do those when absolutely necessary. 
Radiation therapy, which is used to treat a lot of cancers, ironically can also increase the risk of other cancers developing later on. Certain viral infections can also increase the risk of cancer. For example, human papilloma virus, or HPV, can increase the risk of cervical cancer. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C can increase the risk of liver cancer. And in Africa, the Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, is associated with Burkitt's lymphoma. An infection with a bacteria called H. pylori can increase the risk of stomach cancer. An exposure to asbestos can increase the risk of malignant mesothelioma. Stress is something we can't overlook when it comes to cancer. Finally, chronic inflammation in conditions like obesity, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease can increase the risk of cancer. I'll never forget a case that I saw when I was a GI fellow at UC Irvine. A Mexican immigrant with four children was on her fifth pregnancy when she developed a very aggressive stage 4 gastric cancer, all due to an infection with the simple bacteria H. pylori. This was such a challenging case that I presented it at a tumor board along with a pathology resident named Roy Nambudripad, who's actually my now husband. In the United States, we have a growing epidemic of obesity. Obesity is actually a state of chronic inflammation. It's associated with insulin resistance, which causes high levels of insulin, also known as hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia is carcinogenic, and obesity is actually known to increase the risk of both breast and colon cancers. Excess fat is also inflammatory because it's a principal storage site of carcinogenic toxins. I have a whole video dedicated to insulin resistance where you can learn how to reverse it through diet and lifestyle, and I'll link that below. The reason insulin is a problem is it activates something called mTOR, which triggers cell growth and proliferation. Similarly, human growth hormone, which is mediated through a hormone called IGF-1 made in the liver, can also activate the growth of cancer cells. This is why it would be a bad idea to use human growth hormone for anti-aging purposes. What's fascinating is there's a population of dwarves that live in Ecuador, and they have an extremely low cancer rate because they don't make any IGF-1 due to a mutation in their growth hormone receptor gene. Now let's delve into why cancer cells use sugar differently from normal cells in the body. So normal cells take one glucose molecule and turn it into 36 ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. Cancer cells are strange. They take one glucose molecule and turn it into only two ATP and two lactic acid. Normal cells would only do this if there's no oxygen around. For example, if you exercise a lot, you can get lactic acid buildup in your muscles. But cancer cells do this on purpose, and it's called the Warburg effect. Because cancer cells are less efficient at making ATP, they require 10 times more glucose compared to normal cells. No wonder cancer cells love sugar. They need more sugar compared to regular cells. So they suck up the sugar and pump out lactic acid. This Warburg effect gives them a survival advantage because it turns out the lactic acid creates an acidic pH that sabotages the surrounding normal cells. All of these sugary treats would make a cancer cell very happy, and they would also cause a spike in insulin and IGF-1, which also promote cancer cell growth. PET scans take advantage of this principle, and they'll light up areas in the body that are using more sugar. On the left, we have a CT scan of the jaw, and we don't see any abnormal lymph nodes. But on the right, we see a PET scan, and a malignant lymph node is lighting up, because it's more metabolically active and the cancer cells are utilizing more sugar. Since cancer can be so scary and challenging to treat, this leads us to the question, how can we prevent cancer? Let's talk about the power of food, because food acts on our bodies every day, often up to three times a day. Are you giving your body promoters or anti-promoters for cancer cell growth? Promoters include refined sugar, white flour, trans fats, vegetable oils, processed meats, and animal fats from conventionally raised meats. Anti-promoters are the powerful phytochemical compounds that are found in colorful vegetables and fruit. 
Here are my top tips for an anti-cancer diet. So you want to eat whole foods in their natural state, avoiding processed foods, and eating organic as much as possible to avoid pesticides. Your meals should be balanced with protein, fats, and fiber at every meal to maintain a low glycemic index and prevent any spikes in insulin. I encourage eating an abundance of vegetables because this improves the health of your gut microbiome. The cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, and Brussels sprouts have anti-cancer properties. They're a rich source of sulforaphane, which helps your body make glutathione, which is the master antioxidant and detoxifier. They also help in metabolizing estrogens. Aim for five colors a day, because the more colors means the more antioxidants. For example, berries are loaded in antioxidants. It's best to avoid refined sugar and minimize alcohol. Make sure you're drinking clean, filtered water. Finally, it's helpful to have windows of no food, also known as fasting. Fasting activates autophagy. Autophagy comes from the word auto, meaning self, and phagy, which means to eat. So the literal meaning of autophagy is self-eating. Autophagy is a great way to clean up all the garbage inside your cells, reduce your insulin levels, and prevent cancer. I have a whole video dedicated to autophagy, which I'll link below. Did you know that green tea has anti-cancer properties? It has a special polyphenol called epigallocatechin gallate, also known as EGCG, which inhibits angiogenesis. Anything that activates insulin receptors is thought to prevent cancer. That's why the medication metformin is often used as an adjunct in cancer treatments, and some argue that it promotes longevity. There's a natural compound called berberine, which comes from the root of the berberine plant, that has the exact same mechanism of action as metformin. They both activate AMP kinase, which is the enzyme on the insulin receptors but berberine has the added benefits of being anti-inflammatory and preventing the growth of bad bacteria and yeast in the gut microbiome. So berberine is one of my favorite supplements to help patients with their insulin resistance and metabolism. It does have interactions with certain medications like blood thinners, so it's good to check with your doctor. These are my top preventative anti-cancer supplements. Glutathione is the master antioxidant and detoxifier for all the cells in your body. Vitamin C is another excellent antioxidant that can help reverse free radical damage in your cells. Vitamin D is incredibly important for your immune system, so I recommend optimizing your level to 50 to 80 on your blood work. Methyl B complex promotes methylation and detoxification processes in your cells. Fish oil has essential omega-3 fatty acids that help reduce inflammation in the body. Supplements made from turmeric, the yellow Indian spice, has the active compound curcumin that's also anti-inflammatory. We already went over berberine for activating insulin receptors. Magnesium taken at bedtime gives you a deep and restful sleep, and it also helps to move your bowels. Having good bowel movements is one of the most important ways that your body eliminates toxins. Finally, if a woman is having problems with high levels of estrogen, I give them an I3C DIM supplement, which I call a broccoli pill, but it helps them metabolize their estrogens better. On a gut microbiome test, if a person has high levels of something called beta-glucuronidase, I give them calcium D-glucurate to block the recycling of toxins and estrogens from the gut. What else can we do to prevent cancer? This brings us to the seed and the soil analogy. The seed is the cancer cell. We all have cancer cells in our body, but not all of us will develop cancer. The seed of a cancer cell can only grow if the soil is fertile. The soil consists of our diet, lifestyle, exposures, and stress. Fertilizers for cancer cell growth would include tobacco, refined sugars, processed foods, trans fat, and emotional stressors. Unfortunately, some of these are really common in the standard American diet, also known as the SAD diet. Part of the soil includes emotional wounds and stressors. This includes childhood traumas, breakups and divorces, feelings of helplessness, loneliness, and chronic anger, stress, or depression. 
These emotions can cause chronic elevations in the hormone cortisol. It can also cause a rise in inflammatory factors and a slowdown in the immune system. Publications in major journals have shown that these physiological stress mechanisms can contribute to the growth and spread of cancer. This is why it's so important to address your emotional soil as well. It's also important to be cautious with your everyday exposures. Avoid aluminum by buying aluminum-free deodorants. Instead of using perfumes which are bound to phthalates, it's better to use essential oils for fragrance. Make sure your personal care products like shampoos and lotions are all paraben-free. Minimize your exposure to BPA by switching from plastic to glass containers for your food. Never microwave your food in plastic containers. Avoid cooking with pans coated in Teflon, which may have PFOAs. Try to eat organic to avoid exposure to pesticides and use green household cleaning products when possible. An anti-cancer lifestyle is a way of keeping your soil it's suitable for a cancer seed to grow. In addition to eating a clean diet, this includes getting good quality sleep because sleep is when your body repairs your cells and tissues. Exercise helps to stimulate your immune system's defense mechanisms that can fight off cancer cells. Stress management is also important, whether you do yoga, meditation, or other forms of self-care. Mental and emotional health are also super important. This is where having meaningful relationships or even a loving pet can improve your health and protect you from cancer. Finally, what is the music of your life that you would like to dance to? In other words, having a passion and living your life with purpose and fulfillment can also have a protective effect on your immune system. This is the power of the mind-body connection. Early detection of cancer can be life-saving, so it's important to work with your doctor to make sure you're getting all your cancer preventative screening tests. Cervical cancer is preventable with a pap smear. Women should have a pap smear beginning at the age of 21, and it's done every three to five years to screen for the HPV virus and any abnormal cells on the cervix. Breast cancer is the number one cancer in women, affecting one in eight women. The best way to screen for it is using a mammogram, beginning at the age of 40. And if there's dense breast tissue, we recommend an additional breast ultrasound. In high-risk patients, we sometimes also recommend a breast MRI. Colon cancer is preventable with a colonoscopy, beginning at the age of 50 or earlier if there's a strong family history. Although there are some non-invasive stool tests that can screen for colon cancer, the colonoscopy has the advantage of being able to remove any precancerous polyps. Prostate cancer is the number one cancer in men, and we can screen for it with an easy blood test for PSA, which stands for prostate-specific antigen, beginning at the age of 40. So here are the key points. It's important to minimize your exposure to known carcinogens. It's best to eat a clean, organic, and whole foods diet. It's important to address insulin resistance. Cancer cells love sugar. There are some key supplements that can be helpful as an additional preventative measure. Living an anti-cancer lifestyle is the way to keep your soil insuitable for a cancer cell to grow. Finally, work with your doctor to make sure you're doing all the screening tests that are recommended based on your age and risk factors. Thanks so much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it and please share it with your friends and family. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Please leave any of your questions and comments below. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.